that sounded like the meat of the episode to me, but I guess you know, Chris has higher standards than I do. Yeah. He, like, expects stuff out of us and stuff. Oh, my God. I don't know. It's it's crazy so talk. annoying. <laughs> Study of archaeology, but we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. Range of trials as one will call. Welcome to episode four of the Archaeological Fantasies podcast. I'm your host, Sarah, with my co-host, Ken Fader. Today we're discussing the mysterious mound builders. Who were they? How did they get here? Were they Hebrew? Were they Celts? Could they possibly have been Native American? We're going to look at the evidence and discuss the facts. We're even going to discuss why this myth persists even today. Get ready to think critically. Funny bitty blokes you will see are a staple of archaeology. So hey everyone, welcome back to episode four of the Archie Fantasies podcast. What have you been up to, Ken? Well, you know, it's uh, our semester has just uh, started, so things have been sort of crazy, the usual stuff of students... Um, Adding courses, students dropping courses, students complaining about their grades from last semester. So it's been a whirlwind. We're, we're also we're in the middle of a search for a new biological anthropologist. So our, our previous um, uh, anthropologist, bio, biological anthropologist, Mike Park, has retired. So we are looking for a replacement for Park, and that takes a tremendous amount of time. Um, and working on yet another edition of my world prehistory textbook, Past and Perspective. So. They keep me busy, you know, which is say. good because otherwise I'd get in all kinds of trouble. That that sounds like a pretty full plate. And I also heard that there's a job out there for some lucky bioanthropologist. So. Yeah, well, there you go. Absolutely. OK, so I figured that this uh, that this episode we could talk about uh, the mound builder myth. One um, of my favorite topics. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I was just introduced to it uh, during my field school about a year ago. Um I did not – I didn't realize there was so much controversy wrapped up around the mound builders. Um, uh, sure. But I, I got a little bit into it, and it's very interesting actually and not only what people thought built the mounds – back in the day, but also mm. how it was solved. And then to come into modern times, like just even this year and see people continuing to argue that the mounds were not built by native Americans, but instead were built by a variety of other people, right, including yeah. apparently giant Vikings. That's it. So it's the, it's the myth that keeps on giving. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very I, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it is, it was an, it's an interesting um, period in American history. When you've got colonists, most of them in the Midwest coming from, from Western Europe, who are encountering these spectacular archaeological monuments and trying to come up with an explanation for, well, who built them? How old are they? How do they fit into the stories in the Bible? And at the same time, really not comfortable ascribing these, these monuments to the Native Americans who – there was a feeling that, well, certainly they couldn't have done it. Um, it's really interesting when you go back into the contemporary historians in that period who – Again and again, very consistently denigrated the, 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 the capabilities of native people. And there's one, I'll, I'll paraphrase one, where this gentleman, a, a, a naturalist living, working in the Midwest, who said it, it makes as much sense to, to say that American Indians built these mounds as it is to say that the pyramids were built by Martians. And it, so it's like, oh my gosh. Um, and it, it really is, it's, there's a, this broader issue of wanting to to distance native people from these spectacular archaeological monuments and to somehow make a connection between the builders of those monuments and the Europeans who are entering into the new world at that point. Um, it's kind right, of insidious it, in a lot of ways. It is. And, and back – Back in the historical periods, when when the settlers and the Europeans were first encountering it, it's understandable why they would want to try to explain these mounds in terms that they could understand. Right. Um, what I find aggravating and just astounding to me is modern day basically denialists who are insisting that the mounds were built by again white Europeans who had come across way before contact. 
Right. Um, but can you give us a little bit of background on, I mean, you started doing that and then I interrupted you, but could you give us a little bit <laughs> more background on the whole Mound Builder myth thing and then how it was solved basically with good science and good sure. archaeology? I mean, I think one of the oddest elements of the Mount of, of ex- trying to explain why this became a major issue. This was the kind of thing that popular magazines, popular books were devoted to this question, this mystery of who built the mounds. I mean, imagine people today who watch Ancient Aliens, and that's a big deal, and it has you know a, 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 a large audience, and people talk about its water cooler um, conversations about the Ancient Aliens. You just go back to to the 18th and 19th centuries, and the topic wasn't ancient aliens, it was who built those mysterious mounds that are being found throughout Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. And the, the thing that's very peculiar about it is that one of the, the claims, one of the arguments presented by people who said Indians couldn't have done it, is that when white folks, when European settlers were entering into Ohio, for example, indeed, Native Americans were not still building mounds. And so the argument was, well, nobody's ever seen Indians build mounds, so it's it's ridiculous to say that they built them in the past. But the thing that's really weird about that is that if you go back further to the 16th century, and you look at the records of the Spanish explorers, De Soto is probably the best known of these guys. But right. there's Panfilo Narvaez and a bunch of others. And these guys were coming from Spain, they were landing in Florida or thereabouts, and then traipsing across the American Southeast. And these guys, guys like DeSoto, had with them their own record keepers, their own memoirists who wrote down everything that they saw. And if you look at those books, which at the time, 19th century, you could find them in Spanish, but you couldn't find them in English, they gave detailed descriptions of of Native American societies in which large mounds were the dominant um, architectural feature of the sites. So it was not true when people said, well, there's nobody's ever seen Indians building mounds. That may have been true in Ohio in the 19th century, but it sure wasn't true in Florida and Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and the southeastern states. It wasn't true in the 16th century because the yeah, 16th century because guys like DeSoto were talking about enormous urban like settlements with right. miles and miles of cornfields and huge earthen pyramids on top of which the homes of the the, the princes and the kings were situated. There are from that period as well, there are woodcuts showing mounds, showing burial ceremonies. Um, so so the, 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 the weird thing is that gets forgotten, ignored. Maybe it's because most of those those um, records were in Spanish and people entering into Ohio a couple of hundred, 150 years later were not fluent in Spanish, but they certainly did, never um, referenced all of these Spanish accounts of, oh yeah, the Indians are building these mounds and living in these large, dense, urban-like settlements. Right. So because of that that disconnect, that it both the, that temporal disconnect and that linguistic disconnect, when folks are entering into Ohio, um, from places like where I am, I mean, you remember that Ohio, those were the Western territories. And in what is it, the late 1700s and early 1800s, you have large um, contingents of folks from Massachusetts and Connecticut essentially moving west into this, these expanded territories that were considered to belong to Connecticut and Massachusetts. And these guys had, because the, the Indians of New England did not have a tradition of building mounds when they entered into Ohio. And by the time they got there, the, the mound building, the indigenous mound building tradition had ceased. So they were faced with this mysterious, uh, 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 enormous numbers of clearly human made earth monuments, some in giant cone shapes, some shaped like animals, um, others uh, shaped like 
like long linear ridges that enclosed areas, circular ridges that enclosed areas. And there were so many of them, and some of them were so large and so finely made that it was the, the it was ripe for speculation. Who built those things? And if your assumption was, well, it couldn't be Indians, then you came up, and these folks, in fact, came up with all manner of explanations. Virtually every old world group at one time or another was proposed as the possible builders of the ancient mounds. So, I mean, there are folks who are saying, oh, it was, it was the lost tribes of Israel. It was folks from the Middle East. Maybe it was Romans. Maybe it was Egyptians. Maybe it was Celts. Maybe it was Vikings. So every imaginable group was at one time or another um, credited with at least po the possibility was 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 suggested that well those were the guys who came over and built the mounds and it, it you look at some of this old stuff and it's almost like listen they don't care who built them as long as it wasn't the Indians right. and as a result there's all this controversy and all this interest there was a tremendous amount of early archaeological research was directed towards solving the mystery of who it was who built the mounds the, I mean it's really interesting to point out that. The Smithsonian Institution, in their earliest funding by the federal government, it was explicit that one of their tasks was to, in fact, figure out who built the mounds. And there, in, in the budgets, there's there's money earmarked for archaeological research to figure out who built the mounds. Collect artifacts. Let's measure these mounds. Let's compare them to to monumental structures everywhere in the world and see if we can come up with some reasonable explanation as to who built these mounds, again, as long as it wasn't the Indians. Now, so you've got these folks saying, look, um, there's writing found in the mounds. Indians don't have a writing system. And in fact, there are lots of instances in the Midwest in the 19th century of objects that we now recognize to be entirely fake, but bearing scripts, especially Hebrew, but other other languages as well, other written languages. And the attempt was made, therefore, to say, well, if you find something with, with Hebrew on it in a mound, it must be Jews came to the New World 2,000 years ago and built these mounds. Never mind that they weren't doing it in the Old World, but as soon as they got to Ohio, they said, you know what, let's let's build some earthworks. Um, yeah, that, that's the part that always confused me, was all of these cultures that are being attributed with the mound building. And it's like, but they don't do that. They don't yeah. do that in Europe. Why would they come to America and start doing it, that here? It doesn't make a lick of sense, does it? I mean, no. absolutely not. Um, there also were claims, claims were made that uh, metal was being found in the mounds. Now, we do know that, that, had, that there were metal objects found in the mounds. Most of them are copper, uh, made from native copper, which is, it's, it was not made from an ore. It wasn't smelted. And we know the source of that copper. There also is evidence of um, silver objects, um, ear spools, uh, again, made from native, native metals. Um, so those, but, but because the assumption was, the conceit was, well, Native Americans, they're a Stone Age people, so they don't have the capability to make metal objects. When metal objects were found in the mounds, number one, they very often were misidentified as being brass or bronze. In fact, they weren't. But right. when these objects were found, the immediate assumption was, well, see, it could not have been Indians because, after all, Indians were a Stone Age people. Um, it was also – there also was this big argument about how – old the mounds actually were. And I know for those of us who know a little bit about archaeology today, anybody who knows a little bit knows it, well, there's this notion that Native Americans came to the New World via the Bering Land Bridge at least 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. Understand that when people were coming into Ohio in the in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, we didn't really have any direct evidence for that. Um, and so there were those who believed that that the ancestors of the Indians who were living in the United States at the time of its founding, in fact, their ancestors had not been here for very long. And some of the mounds, the, because of the enormous trees growing on top of them, it's a really early, it's an early example of dendrochronology, that there was um, a reverend in Marietta, Ohio, who 
started cutting down trees on top of mounds. Some of those mounds still exist. You can go see them. He started cutting down these trees and counting the rings and saying, well, my, my gosh, if this, if this huge oak is growing on the top of this burial mound, and if the oak has 400 rings, well, then the mound has to be older than that. And in some cases, tr- uh, even older examples of trees are found. And so as, as they were doing this sort of early tree ring dating, they came up with numbers that the conceit was that Indians hadn't been for very, here for very long, so that the mounds were too old to have been constructed by the Indians. So again and again and again, they, were, they so cherry-picked the data to, to support their preconceived notion that, no, the Indians couldn't have done it, which left this big void, this big mystery. Well, if it wasn't the Indians, who in the world could it have been? And the, right. I mean, the interesting thing is it really isn't until the end of the 19th century when the Smithsonian um, hires this ornithologist. He's not an archaeologist or historian. He's an ornithologist, Cyrus Thomas. And they give him a budget and they say, listen, there's so much controversy, so many arguments about this. What we want you to do with this budget is we want you to collect a lot of artifacts. We want you to measure a lot of these mounds and come up with an exploit, come up with a solution. And Cyrus Thomas did an, an, an amazing job. And in fact, a lot of the artifacts that are housed at the, um, the Museum of the, the National Museum of the American Indian uh, can be traced back to those collections being put together to answer the question who built the mounds. And Cyrus Thomas, the book is 800 pages and it is, it is, it is a wonderful book. I mean, it's it's chock full, packed with information. And Thomas, not for the first time, but for the first time, definitively said, look, all of these arguments given for why it couldn't have been Indians, when you look at the data, all those arguments fall away. There, there's no iron swords in the mounds. The artifacts that bear writing, these things all uh, um, are fraudulent. They don't make any sense. The mounds themselves are not millions of years old. They certainly fit in, in terms of their their, um, their age. It fits into a, a model of Native Americans having built these mounds. And, and the fact that Native Americans weren't seen in Ohio but building mounds historically, Cyrus Thomas knew that well, Spanish explorers a little bit further south had lots of eyewitness accounts traced to those folks of Native Americans building and using the mounds. And, he, and Thomas said, look, when you put all that together, it's abundantly clear that it's Native Americans who are responsible. It's the ancestors of the Indians who are living there now. Their ancestors built these mounds. And, you know, the, the, the point is, you got to give credit where credit is due. And that's Cyrus Thomas is, is largely responsible for that in putting together his, his explorations of the mounds in the late 19th century. Now, he was attacked for that opinion for a long time, wasn't he? Well, yeah, I mean... I, I mean, you know, he had to defend it anyway. He had to defend yeah. it pretty strongly. And, and of course, and the thing is, like any other scientific investigation, there were, you know, he, there were some speculations in, in his work. There were some errors in his work. Um, and, and people kind of glommed on to those who weren't happy with his conclusion. But, you know, when you have an 800-page book and when you have 799 and a half pages are really pretty good in showing um, who built the mounds, uh, it, it right. doesn't make a lot of sense to focus on the half a page in which, you know, he got some stuff wrong. Um, I, I'd like to believe that uh, my books, everything is exactly perfectly right, but I know that's not true. And and um, and Cyrus Thomas admitted that as well. So I mean, the, those those arguments kind of fall away when you look at the the overwhelming bulk of the data that shows definitively that this was a Native American practice that we now are, are um, archaeologically we know that we can trace this back probably more than 5,000 years, this this um, pattern or this practice of moving around a lot of soil to make monuments, monuments that some are burials, some are um, enclosures, some are effigies in the shape of animals, and some are truncated pyramids on the tops of which we find evidence of structures. We hope you're enjoying this episode. If you are and would like to support the podcast, please take a minute to give us a thumbs up or rate the podcast on your favorite podcast app. 
Leaving a brief comment also helps us engage with our audience, and it's good for the algorithm too. If you want to know more about the topics we're discussing, be sure to head over to our Anchor site and look for the show notes for this episode. Links will be in the description. Thank you again, and let's get back to the show. It's an interesting thing. This is an interesting thing that I think is 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 broadly significant. Is that so many of the artifacts that today people say yes, but but how do you archaeologists explain these swords, or how do you archaeologists explain these objects with 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 writing on them? They were all found in a very narrow time period when archaeology in the New World was kind of in its infancy. Um, it's really interesting. Now, I used to do CRM and we dug thousands of te test pits. I know that you have probably in your life have dug hundreds and thousands of test pits. And if you add them all up, if you add up all the CRM test pits done all over the country in the last few decades, there are, I mean, this is not an exaggeration, there probably are more than a million test excavations done across the United States. And what's really interesting, those are all done by people like you who have background and training in archaeology, you know what you're doing, you know what you're looking for. It's not a coincidence that all of this modern archaeology done by folks who have training, we never find Hebrew writing. We never find iron swords. We never find anything that doesn't, that indicates somebody other than Native Americans built the mounds. Now, your explanation and my explanation and a rational explanation would probably be that there must be something weird about that 19th century and those people finding those artifacts, those things just aren't legitimate because once archaeology becomes pro professionalized, well, nobody's finding that stuff anymore. Once we know stratigraphy, once we can assess the legitimacy of a stratigraphic profile and, and can show because of our experience that, oh yeah, that's, that's intact, but this one has been messed with. As soon as that happens, these, these bizarre artifacts are never found. Now, I will tell you, though, that you will talk to people who will accuse you and me and all the other professional archaeologists with knowing the truth. That is, it was Hebrews or Phoenicians or Celts who built the mounds, but we're hiding it from people, which is one of the most bizarre accusations imaginable. I mean, I know a lot of archaeologists. You know a lot, a lot of archaeologists. Do you think if anybody was founding finding genuine Hebrew artifacts in mounds. We could keep it quiet. <laughs> we could keep right. it a secret. Uh, archaeologists drink way too much. <laughs> you know, well, well, and bar, it, you it know, would be a really awesome discovery, too. But so you're going on about the Hebrew artifacts, but uh, specifically we're talking about like the Newark Hol Holy Stones. Right. Um, there was another one. I want to say the Bat Creek Stone. Was that yep, part of Bat the Newark Creek Stone. Stones? Okay. No, it's not, that's so, not part of the Newark Stones. That's in Tennessee, but that's another ostensible artifact. That was artifact. also found inside of a mound, as I yeah. recall. Yes. So yeah. we're looking at specific uh, specific artifacts um, that people would be more familiar with by their, I guess, colloquial names. Um, the Newark Holy Stones mm -hmm. were found in 1860 by uh, David Wyrick. Right. And um, he claimed that there was Hebrew writing on the stones. Oh, that, that, he, that claim is, is accurate. There's Hebrew writing on the stones. Right, right, right. That's, but the deal is how to get there. Right. And, and, and along with the Back Creek Stone, I believe the the Back Creek Stone is also Hebrew letters. Right. They don't necessarily spell a word and much like the holy the Newark holy stones they um the specific hebrew dialogue that's being used on both of these artifacts was too modern well here's here's the the, the one of the funniest aspects of the newer holy stones and i give, give all due credit to um, to brad lepper archaeologist at the, the state archaeologist in ohio at the ohio historical society and uh, brad brad is you know he's my main man when it comes to the newer holy stones and i've seen the real deal they're at a, a small museum 
in Coshocton, Ohio, the Johnson Hummerkhaus Museum. And so they have the originals, the actual artifacts still there. And the deal with the newer Coley stones was the first one that was found, which is called the Keystone, is this really interesting kind of four-sided, it looks like a big plum bob, you know, that you would use for, for doing a um, uh, doing carpentry. And right. there are, on each of the faces, of the four faces, there are Hebrew letters. And I tell I recognize the Hebrew. I went to Hebrew school when I was a kid in New York, <laughs> and I recognize those letters. And I couldn't translate them, but it's like, one says holy of holies, and one the other says something about, you know, it's all related to God. These are all um, phrases that you would expect ancient Hebrews to have been writing. But when Weirich found this thing, Thing. Um, and please understand that that archaeology today is 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 it's a quantum leap of, in terms of field work in terms of what was done back then. That is our ability to measure a provenance of an artifact to make sure that what we find is exactly where it was left by somebody a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand years ago. Our record keeping, our ability to measure in locations is bears no comparison to what was going on back then where people were basically woodchucks. They were digging. <laughs> they were just digging stuff up and saying, ooh, look yeah. what I found. And yeah. so we don't have – there is nowhere where we can find a detailed stratigraphic po profile, for example, of exactly the context in which this – Regardless, um, Weirich was not fluent in Hebrew, and so he brought it to a local expert in Hebrew who identified it as Hebrew and said, oh, yes, this is Hebrew. Here's what it says. And when Weirich said, we found this in a mound and we believe it's a couple of thousand years old, the scholar who, who translated it said, well, but that's impossible. This is a right. modern version of Hebrew. This is a Hebrew that maybe goes back – we can trace back – a hundred years or 200 years, but not, certainly not the age of the mounds. It's the wrong kind of Hebrew. And what's really interesting about that is that Weirich you know, was kind of disappointed by that, and, but went back to, to look some more. And about six months later, a couple of miles down the road, he finds another object with Hebrew. Only this time, it's the right kind of Hebrew. He was like, right. gee, that's amazing. So then he brings this out and shows it to the various scholars who say, oh my gosh, yeah, this is Hebrew. It's the Ten Commandments. There's what appears to be a, a, a uh, like a bas relief of Moses on it. And they say, this is remarkable because this Hebrew looks like the right time period. It's not anachronistic. It's the right time period for how old we think the mounds are. And you know, you walk away from that and you say, well, listen, there are two possibilities here. One one is by sheer total coincidence, one guy digging in Ohio, six months apart, a couple of miles apart, finds a fake Hebrew artifact and then a genuine Hebrew artifact, the only kind in, their, uh, in existence, or maybe a simpler explanation is whoever made that first one was sloppy. Mm -hmm. Picked the wrong version of Hebrew. And then the, the scholars who identified it as a fraud were in fact schooling the faker in how to improve the fake the next time around. So, you know, whoever made the newer Coley Stones after the first one kind of fell flat said, okay, now I know what the right kind of Hebrew is. I'll make another Another fake, I'll put that in the ground and David Weirich will find it because he's digging around and now we've got a genuine artifact. But I think that's it, it is a far more um, parsimonious explanation, a far more obvious explanation that instead of by coincidence we have a fake and a real Hebrew artifact found by the same guy a few months apart in Ohio, um, it's a hell of a lot more likely that the first one was a lesson learned. The the, mm -hmm. the the debunking of the hoax by whoever pulled that fraud off. Uh, several years ago in Connecticut, we had a guy who, who clearly planted a bunch of fake archaeological artifacts. They're not like anything anybody has ever seen in North America. And it was pretty clear by the uh, for those who excavated the site, it was really clear that these objects, and there are a couple dozen of them, had been faked. And when the state archaeologist of Connecticut, Nick Bellantoni, 
great guy. When they, they the reporters came out to view the site and they asked, well, how did you know it was fake? And Nick's reaction was, you know, I'm kind of loath to tell you how I knew because all – Whoever faked this is going to listen to this and go, okay, now I know how to do a better job of faking yeah. the next time. And that's, I know how to do it better for the next time I do it. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, there's actually – that there, there's a history in archaeology of exactly that, of – of, of hoaxers and faker, fakers trying to pull off an archaeological fake, doing a really bad and sloppy job of it. But then when that hoax is debunked, it's it's a primer for them and how to do a better job the next time. Um, right. And so it's, I think it's always good for archaeologists to kind of hold back on on some of the reasons we use for for explaining why something is a fake, so that you know, the, the fakers don't get too much knowledge and too much information. But that was that was the deal with the newer Holy Stones. Um, a, a little less than a year ago, uh, to move a little further afield, I was out in um, New Mexico in the town of Los Lunas, that's south, uh, half an hour, forty minutes south of Albuquerque, uh-huh. and. Outside of Los Lunas is the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone. Now, this is – it's a hike. It's, it's a little bit of a hike, um, but it's really cool. It's this huge boulder that has a whole uh, – virtually a whole page of Hebrew writing on it. And the first hist- – and you will see if you look up Los Lunas Decalogue Stone, meaning it's the Ten Commandments, you'll see plenty of websites today of people extolling this uh, the, the, as a genuine archaeological artifact, although they never quite get around to explaining how ancient Jews ended up in New Mexico. Uh, what a thousand years ago, right? I, I've walked out to see it, and the thing is, it's the thing is an, an obvious fake because the 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 um, there's there are petroglyphs, there are genuine um, there's genuine rock art in the immediate surrounding vicinity, and the, that is substantially weathered. It looks like it's been there for a very long time. I don't have any way, any way of directly dating those petroglyphs, but by comparison, using kind of a, a relative dating method, the Los Lunas Hebrew letters look nothing whatsoever like the the real petroglyphs because they simply aren't old enough to have developed any kind of weathering on them. And that's, right. that's I'm, obvious. I'm looking at an image of them right now, and I mean, they're Strikingly clean against. Yeah. and if you look at them, surface. yeah, it's a bas- it's in basalt, and so what's what it's going on is whoever made this thing. By the way, the absolutely the earliest historical reference to the Los Luna Stone is 1933. Right, and in that reference, the claim is made. Oh, but the person who who was talking about this stone in 1933 remembers seeing it when he was a kid, like in the uh, 50 years before. But there's absolutely no evidence for that. The guy was only talking about it in the 1930s. But, and also, when you look at it really carefully, you can see where there there are um, old and original cracks in the basalt, and the, the, the carvings went through those, but then there are even mo- very recent-looking chips, exfoliations from the surface, and the, the letters actually go into those older um, those those more much more recent exfoliations. So those letters couldn't have been in there before the rock actually sheared off. So it's right. it's, it's 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 an obvious fake. But you know, people are in in a couple of instances, several instances historically, people went to a lot of trouble to try to prove something like that. What's kind of interesting is 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 here in Connecticut, Ezra Stiles was um, the first president of Yale University. And Ezra Stiles was really interested in Native Americans. We've been talking about, you know, this is a long time ago, uh, a few hundred years ago. And Stiles actually in one of his memoirs wrote about examining Hebrew letters on a, a, the face of a cliff in Connecticut. The thing was, though, that Stiles recognized that it was very recent and, in fact, uh, one of the interpretations is, in fact, that it was students from Yale who went up on the mountain, carved those in there, knowing that Styles would think it was really interesting, but also recognizing that Styles would realize that the things were fake. The problem is when those stories disappear and people then go up on the mountain, they see Hebrew, they get this impression that, wow, maybe that's really ancient and maybe it's – we need to rewrite the history books or something like that. But the deal is that, that – 
that from an archaeological perspective, as the way archaeologists work, um, we look at context, we look at stratigraphy, we look at associations, and these objects all fa fail those tests, that we don't have any good stratigraphic context, we don't have really good record keeping, we don't have any of the kinds of evidence that we require in a, in a modern context to show that the thing was legitimately ancient. And although it's hard to criticize somebody doing archaeology 100 or 200 years ago for not having the skills we now have, and that's fair, right. but then that means that, well, there should be more of these things out and about, and when we've got literally a million test pits being excavated in the United States by professional archaeologists, experienced people, and we ain't finding this stuff, it probably it, it, that seems like the, the most reasonable explanation for that is that those things were planted in a short period of time when archaeology was pretty much in its infancy and that now that we're too smart to be fooled by that, nobody's planting those artifacts anymore and so we're not finding them. Well, and that's one of the interesting things about the Back Creek Stone uh, especially is because it was found during a uh, well, that's, that's one of the claims for the authenticity of the Back Creek Stone is that it was found during an academic uh, archaeological recovery and well, and there's it's recorded that one of the guys on the team found it and brought it to the guy heading up the the excavation but even at the time of its discovery it wasn't thought to be a real artifact well you see the, the deal is and and Again, you have to understand in the history of archaeology that things were way were very different in the 18th and 19th centuries than they are now. The the excavation, the the guy who dug that up, Emmert, was working indirectly for the Smithsonian. Yeah. So a lot of pieces, folks will say, see, it was a Smithsonian archaeologist who did this. The deal is back in the day, and this is true for the work that um, Cyrus Thomas relied on, is that the Smithsonian wasn't didn't have trained archaeologists with a lot of experience who they sent out from the home office to do archaeology. What they did was they found local people who said, yeah, I do archaeology, and the way you – legally could do archaeology was by saying, yeah, I do archaeology. There was, there, there was no, there was no, there were no laws um, defining who could do that work. And if somebody was known as an artifact collector and he wanted to make a little extra money and, and he had a, a decent reputation, the Smithsonian would say, okay, we'll pay you this money, get us some artifacts for our collection. So it is, it's, it's a, a, it's a misapprehension to think that all those guys were doing professional, modern archaeology. Um, many of them were, but not all of them. And so you no, have field, to look at each case individually. The field was very much in its infancy during that time. So, I mean, like you said, you've got some people who are doing really good science, and you've got some people who are just running and grabbing what they could and then running away. And, and it's hard to... I mean, it, it's it's your knee jerk reaction to judge the past by modern principles, and right. it's hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with the history of the field why certain excavations are more reliable than other excavations, and 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 that kind of stuff. And it's it's a hard thing to explain to people, but it does need to be understood that different technology comes in and things upgrade and all that. And people see what we do today and they're like, Oh, why weren't they doing it back then? It's like, well, cause they couldn't, you know, and there's no reason to, to deny what was done in the past just because they didn't have what we have right. today. But at the right. same time, we need to take what for, from the past with a small grain of salt, especially when it's such strange things as here, we're digging a mound and we're finding all of this material that points to native American and native American activity. And then we have this, one artifact that looks like a fake to begin with that's written in Hebrew. Right. And it's, it's you know, it is – there are people 
who will say, well, well, listen, if you deny the legitimacy of the excavation of the Bat Creek, why do you accept the legitimacy of all those other things that Cyrus Thomas relied on? And the point here is that the you know the um, the old Carl the old saw, which I will now misquote Carl Sagan, that extreme extreme claims require extreme levels of proof or of evidence, and that's the case. I mean, you're exactly as you as you phrased it. If you you've got dig after dig after dig showing abundantly clearly that it was Native Americans who were responsible for, th- for these. When you ha- when you come up, especially historically, with an example of something that seems to disclaim that or seems to contradict that, the burden is on is not on the ninety nine point nine percent of the evidence that shows it was Native Americans. The burden falls on those who say this one artifact disproves everything else that you've got um, in in the field. So it's the folks who are claiming that the, the Newark Holy Stones are legit. The burden does fall on them. Folks who are claiming the Bat Creek Stone or the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone or a handful of others artifacts. And the other, the, the burden falls on them. We hope you're enjoying this episode. If you are and would like to support the podcast, please take a minute to give us a thumbs up or rate the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Leaving a brief comment also helps us engage with our audience, and it's good for the algorithm too. If you want to know more about the topics we're discussing, be sure to head over to our Anchor site and look for the show notes for this episode. Links will be in the description. Thank you again, and let's get back to the show. The other thing about this, and it's it's something that that I, that people who are not archaeologists sometimes forget, and that we as archaeologists take it so, so much for granted that we don't emphasize this. And we really should. Here's the bottom line: it is relatively easy to make a fake object, a single object or a handful with some ancient script on it, put it in the ground and claim to find it. That's relatively easy. Right. It is almost impossible, and I think really impossible, to create an entire archaeological site that itself is fraudulent. And so the, right. the, the, the deal here is, if there were ancient Hebrews in Ohio making the newer Coley stones, where are the settlements that look like ancient Hebrew settlements in Ohio? Where are the burials that reflect a Hebrew tradition of burial practices? Where are the raw materials that were brought over from the old world? Where are the settlement patterns that look like sites in Israel 2,000 years ago? Where are those sites in Ohio? Right. The reason we don't find those is two reasons. One, they're not there. But the, the second is that's impossible. I can not imagine anybody replicating an entire archaeological site, putting it in some farmer's field and saying, hey, look, I have found an ancient Hebrew settlement in Ohio. However, taking a piece of slate or a piece of ceramic and scratching some Hebrew letters on it, um, putting it in acid or, or, or rubbing some dirt on it so it looks old, putting it in a hole in the ground and somebody finding it, that's... Listen, I think I think a lot of people could do that fairly readily. And you know, the archaeology is not about finding treasure and it's not about finding single, you know, one-offs with with writing on them. It's about right. finding context. And you know, unless I, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I I'm with you there. I I think that a lot of the the pseudo-archaeology and the fringe groups, they put too much emphasis on individual items right. or oh, individual sure. finds. And and, you know, you never hear them talk about a site. You always hear them talk about an artifact or right. a group of artifacts. And it's it's uh, it's aggravating because you, you're you like, yes, these are very cool. And, and yes, these were actually as old as you seem to think they are. Then that would be interesting as well. But it still doesn't stop this site or the location where you're claiming that those things coming from, it doesn't stop that from belonging to the peoples that it belongs to because we have more evidence to support that right. than we have to support your handful of artifacts 
that you're claiming is whatever you're claiming it's to be. Um, but it's, I mean, part of that is, I mean, think of any modern movies, like the Indiana Jones franchise. You know, all those are about one-offs. You know, the eye, the ruby eye of the idol or right, the Ark right. of the Covenant. And so it's right. all about that one object. And and people maybe have the impression that that's what we're, we're doing. We find these one-offs, these one objects, and that we rewrite the history books from that perspective. But no, no, that's not what we find. We find the places where people live, where we find 99% of what we find is their trash, the stuff they threw away, the stuff they, they used up, the stuff they lost, the stuff they abandoned, the stuff they cared so little about they threw it on the ground that's 99.9 percent of the archaeological record but you know what try making an entire village right right from scratch you can't do it it's it's impossible um, well, especially and not put it in the ground in a way that it's going to be convincing because right. i mean you say make a village and people think oh well i'll just go make some thatch roofs and some some mud huts and stuff like that and it's like no that's not what it looks like at all in an archaeological yeah, exactly. site right you're, yeah. you're, you're looking at stains and you're looking at wall remnants and post holes and things that you would not recognize as being a site unless you've been trained to spot that even this example in connecticut where this guy did a lot of work in this sort of due diligence and putting together a fake archaeological site but what he didn't know is that when you did a hole in the ground, right. you, cut, you cut through roots, modern roots. And when you then put an object in there that's supposed to be some ceremonial object, and when you cover it up, and when somebody digs that up, the soil doesn't feel right. It's not as compacted because, well, that's been dug up. And when you remove that soil, you see the cross section of all those roots that the guy had cut through. And like, oh, like oh, you know, a month before. It's virtually, I won't say absolutely impossible, but it's virtually impossible. You can't fool anybody that way, and it's too much work. Um, and that's, so that, I mean, the bottom line here is, listen, I mean, look, think about the Kensington runestone, which is this supposedly this this runestone that that dates to what the 14th century. That's in Minnesota, and right. it's got Viking Norse writing on them. And most archaeologists, most historians are skeptical. There are some folks claiming that, well, but the the it, based on the style of the writing itself, that it may be legitimate by the weathering or where maybe it's legitimate. But but here. Here's the question. Um, archaeologists absolutely thoroughly accept that historically the Norse got here before Columbus. Why do we accept that? Well, we accept that because you've got sites like Alonso Meadow, which are entire communities of people living out a piece of their lives, throwing stuff away, losing stuff, building houses, uh, um, smelting iron, and that's in the ground. Those people were there. Now, the Kensington Runestone is just, it's a one-off. It's this one object. When archaeology has been done in the vicinity of the Kensington Runestone, do they find the camp where those Vikings ostensibly were, were, were living when they made that? No. Do they find the burials of, of, of Vikings explorers? No. No. Do they find the, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artifacts that would be left behind even in a small temporary camp where people are eating and throwing stuff away and sharpening their tools and losing buttons and throwing away their pipes and on and on and on? That's that's, that has not been found. So it's not – I mean that's, that's an important point to make. It's not that archaeologists are invariably doubters, that we doubt any of this could possibly happen. It's just – you know, the, what's the license plate in Missouri? I don't know if they still have it on their license plates. Which, they're the show me state. Show Archaeologists me state. are we're, – we're the show me scientists. Make all the claims you want, but we have a level of evidence or a level of proof that we need before we are going to accept the claim that that one-off that looks like, well, maybe that's Hebrew. Well, maybe it's Phoenician. Maybe it's Celt It's Ogum or whatever. Well, no, that's too easy to fake. We need the village where those people – we're living. Right. Find and that. Trash. Find that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, you know, the, the archaeology's watchword is that trash is truth. And, true. and you just can't get around that. And that's mostly what we do is we dig. There was, there was a, a wonderful, uh, there was an Odyssey series years ago that had a, a bunch of really cool archaeology videos. And one of them was called Other People's Garbage. 
Yeah. And it was all about archaeology. It was was great. Jim Dietz was in it and Charles Faulkner, great archaeologists. Um, And and that's what archaeology is. We're we're looking at people's garbage. And don't tell me that they, well, though, they were really neat back in those days. Nobody's that neat. So if you don't have the garbage, you don't have the evidence that people were there, that the people you're claiming were there. Um, You know, people were really skeptical. Historians and archaeologists were skeptical about the Norse sagas that seem to indicate that 500 years before Columbus, um, Norse came to North America, explored a little bit, had at least one, maybe a couple of settlements. They were skeptical. But then when the evidence of the garbage left behind by those settlers was found in the 1960s, we all said, oh, yeah, great. Good for you. You know, we we don't automatically um, try to to disprove that. We say, well, great. You have reached that 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 level of evidence that we need to accept the presence of this particular group of people. Good for you. Um, and so, but we just don't see that for any of these other groups. So okay, so we've we've definitely covered the history of the Mound Builder myth, and we've definitely covered why it couldn't possibly be Jewish people, um, or at least the Hebrews. And right. there there are other groups that have been credited with it. Um, the the oh, really sure. big one is the Celts, uh, was this, uh, Prince Murdoch. There's actually plaques in the south yeah. near some of the um, the uh, earth forts. That's that's Madoc, who was a Welsh Madoc. prince, like yeah, in Welsh. the twelfth the twelfth century. Um, I think it's in in Mobile Bay. There's actually a, a, a sign saying, you know, Prince Madoc and his band of merry men entered into America here in 1170 AD 1170, something like that. And yeah, archaea. I mean, people have looked for that kind of physical evidence that we've been talking about. They haven't found any of it. Right. But uh, yeah, there are these stone forts throughout the southeast that have. On occasion, people have said those were the, the, the redoubts, those were the, 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 the villages built by these Welsh settlers of the southeast. And invariably, when archaeology has been done, they don't find not a single yeah. artifact that would that would support that hypothesis. What well, I found even if they found the, a single artifact, they right. did way more than that. But, but yeah, but what I'm saying, yeah, right, exactly. So they, they yeah, haven't no, found the kind of evidence that we would need to support that. Um, and this is, it's, it's, it's interesting. Up in New England, we have a lot of those kinds of claims of, of Celtic, of a Celtic presence here. Um, and, and, but, and again, it's the same kind of issue that, but there's no clear evidence that, it, no, the kinds of evidence that an archaeologist absolutely needs to have presented in order to support that hypothesis. Okay, that, so, go ahead. No. Well, so I, I wanted to move us forward a little bit because sure. I know that uh, the the Lost Tribes of Israel is like the number one, aside from aliens, the Lost Tribes of Israel is like the number one, the, they built the mounds. Right. Um, and probably the number two is Celtic or Viking influence. And then you get a little smattering pretty much with everybody else. I've seen people claim that it was early Chinese explorers. Um, I've seen I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. Lizard people. Right. Um, well, and there, and there was a, there was one claim, I think, in the 19th century that I mean, you want to you want to add a whole bunch of crazy stuff that the mounds were really big and they were built by people who domesticated woolly mammoths and mastodons to pull all of the dirt to pile up the dirt to make the mounds. So now we've got this bizarre combination of late Pleistocene megafauna being I'm not even sure how that works. How does that even work? I, I'm not exactly sure. Of course, if you believe but, that people lived with alongside dinosaurs, that could be a little bit more understandable, I suppose. Yeah, there, there are no rules. When it comes to pseudo-archaeology, I'm not sure there are any definitive rules adhered to by the claimants. Yeah, well, and, and that's where I wanted to jump to next. Why do you think the modern... Now, it, it is not accepted in the mainstream anymore that Europeans came over and built the mounds. That That is no, right, completely been debunked. Everybody knows that the Native Americans built it, and we can even assign... I mean, we've assigned cultures to them. We can trace these cultures. We can see how the mound building itself uh, 
migrated across the continent. Yeah, these sites um, are. We can date these sites. We can trace oh, yeah. the raw the raw materials that are coming in from various places. I mean, it's it's wonderful at Cahokia, which is the most impressive of these mound sites in in um, Collinsville, Illinois. Was just, Cahokia was essentially a Native American city with a population that may have exceeded ten thousand people. The earliest yeah. cities in the Middle East had about ten thousand people. So you're looking at uh, it was it was dispersed. It was a wide area, but it was it was a very large population. And the archaeologists who have worked there, who have done an amazing job of reconstructing what the place looked like, of of the significance of the site, but also the raw materials that came into Cahokia from hundreds, even a thousand miles away. Raw materials, things like shell from the Gulf Coast and copper from Michigan and um, what obsidian from Idaho that comes into Cahokia. The artisans there make those into finished products that, and, that then get traded and dispersed back into the countryside where they end up in the burials of of local rulers. It's it's amazing that we, we know about the economics of the site, the subsistence practices of the site, the, the construction practices. So archaeologists know a ton about these places because of the work that's been done. And in all that work that's been done, you know, there just isn't, there aren't any Europeans in that story. There aren't any right. Africans in that story. There are Native Americans in that story. Well, and so why do you think to to modern times, why do you think there are still people in the fringe element that will argue that maybe not all of the mounds, but certain specific mounds were not built by the Native Americans. They were built by white Europeans of some sort. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think there are, there are different explanations for different subgroups of these kind of fringe archaeologies. And, and listen, it would be a mistake for us not to point out that a certain cohort of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, not all of them, but a certain grouping of them, believe that the events that are discussed or described in the Book of Mormon actually happened in the American Midwest. Yeah. And so if you if you take a literal interpretation of the Book of Mormon, so those those folks being talked about are living in places today like Ohio and Illinois and New York and Tennessee and and so those mounds since they date to the past, the attempt is made to connect the archaeology of this region to what the Book of Mormon describes. Now there are there are uh, probably a, a gr far greater percentage of of of, uh, of Mormons who believe that the of the the item the the history described in the Book of Mormon actually occurred in Central America. But there, but you know, if it was a, a couple of years ago, I was involved marginally in a, a video uh, that called the um, the Lost Civilizations of America, which yeah, was in fact and, and ended up right. We've, we've talked about that before, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we've covered that. Yeah, but no, and, go ahead. But I'm just saying that that I mean, hell, man, that was that was highlighted on an episode of Glenn Beck's show where it was right. showing images from that. That video and that he has a huge audience and saying, I didn't know this. Did we know that there were these Hebrew artifacts? Did we know that there were these great cities? And this this attempt to again to to somehow connect the Book of Mormon to these mouths certainly is an is, is one of the underpinning uh, perspectives of at least one element of the, the folks who believe that it wasn't American Indians who built the mounds or that the American Indians were, in fact, these groups that were discussed in the Book of Mormon. So there, there certainly is that. The thing that bothers me the, you know, more than anything else, I think, is, is that just – the, the, the level of ignorance on the part of the American public concerning the mound builders, this, this, this amazing uh, aspect of America's history um, is forgotten or unknown, is kind of swept under the rug. When I, when I was a grad student, uh, I first heard about the mound builders. I don't know about you, but man, the first time I heard about the mound builders, I never heard about them in high school. We took no. social studies in high school. That wasn't in any history book. And it wasn't until I was an undergraduate, took a course in North American prehistory, and was blown away by the, the photographs shown by the archaeologist who was given the course. And was, 
I had no idea this was in America. And the funny thing is when I was an undergrad, I did a paper. I wrote a paper about Cahokia. And then when I was in grad school, there was a, a, an episode or an episode of a meeting of the Society for American Archaeology in St. Louis. And I was there as a young grad student. And because it's so, the Cahokia is nearby, it's, it's, it's not that far away. I ended up going to Cahokia. Um, but I, I don't remember if I've told this before on the, in, in, the, in the webcast, but um, when I, I tried to get to it, I asked the, the guy behind the counter at the hotel, how can I get to Cahokia? And he had no idea what it's – this is a guy who lives half an hour away from the site. He had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. And when, and when I told him it was the big Indian site, he leaned in and he said to me, oh, sir, there haven't been any Indians here for years. I don't know well, what he thought I was me- – I meant. There's that, there's that part of the, the mentality too that I don't – I don't know what to do with it's, – it's not just the denying that Native Americans built the mounds. It's denying that Native Americans still exist. It's in, And I think, it, I think it goes hand in hand with why more, more, lay, more people of the public don't, under, don't know that, um, that the mounds themselves still exist and they can go look at them. I mean there, there's beautiful sites all throughout Ohio. I mean they're gorgeous and one of the, the really, really big, nice ones is open to the public and you can go and take a tour and walk around. I don't think you can walk up on the walls themselves but I mean this was one of the big – Big octagon forts with oh, yeah. uh, walled um, walkway, hallway kind of things. And they're like, yeah, these walls, when they were at their heyday, these things were five feet tall. And I'm like, these yeah. are taller than I am. The, the and, Ohio, yeah, the Ohio Historical Society themselves have a series of mound sites that are open to the public. There are some of them have museums on site. The yeah. Hopewell, Hopewell Culture and National Monument, which is, used to be called Mound City, is a federal national monument. Yeah. And there's a beautiful museum and you can walk among these mounds they're all over the place uh, Serpent Mound which is also Ohio Historical Society yeah. open to the public and you can climb up this kind of this this tower and look down at this amazing 1350 foot long snake snake effigy made of dirt um, I think if, if people were to go to those sites and, and experience them for themselves they might be disabused of some of these more bizarre claims. If you, when you walk into a museum and you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things like spear points and Native American pottery and clear evidence that, oh yeah, I recognize this as Native American, and no, I don't see any bronze axes, and I don't see any giant you know, metal swords, and I don't see any Hebrew writing, you can't help but come away from that saying, oh, I guess it was Indians after all. But, yeah. but we need to do a better job of, of, of encouraging people to go out and see those sites and to to engage in their own you know archaeological odyssey which i've been doing for the last eight years of looking at the 50 most important archaeological sites that are open to the public and i i i maybe i have a, this pollyanna attitude that if people were to experience these sites for themselves um they probably would be um it would be less easy to to uh to convince them that these things were built by some mysterious group of non natives well and they would certainly have it would certainly give them more access to education and i think the education itself is the important tool here it, it's it's not just going and seeing the mounds because if you go there and you have no context you know you're just you're you're going to start drawing your own conclusions and it might be fun to fantasize but you want to know the truth it, or at least the facts i should say right and that's where the museum, the on-site museums come in, and that's where the tour guides come in. And, oh, for sure, right. And I mean, I think experiencing that and then having the evidence laid out in front of you as it would be done in a museum. Because um, a lot of these places that are open to the public do have – they're not huge museums, but they are pretty robust museums. Uh, Angel Mounds has a really good one. Um, they've got a – Yeah, I've been a, there. That's a, that's a nice – it's a really nice one, huh? Yeah, and I dug yeah. one of those holes. That one of those is holes that right? is mine. Yeah. Did you really? Oh my god. I'm really proud of that hole too. Uh, it had well, straight walls. <laughs> but I tell you, say that. I mean, that's why I'm I'm working on this book project, this 50 sites project. Yeah. Um, 
that that I want it would be great if people when they went to these sites had you're right exactly some scientific context this is what this site means this is what we know about the site this is how we know what went on at this site um, and then to experience it for themselves there's, there's not Nothing like that. But, uh, yeah, a lot of these places that are open to the public, go and look at them. Go and see them for yourself. Oh, yeah. And, and especially go to the museums. And, and there's, a lot of these places also have wonderful web presence. The Cahokia Mounds um, website is extremely useful and valuable. The websites, the, the various um, – the website of the Ohio Historical Society, again, is tremendous. Very brief, succinct descriptions of the sites, what's been excavated there, the dating of the sites, how they know how old the sites are and putting them in broader context and that's that's another that's a great thing. the internet can be a great thing when the the information is that's being shared is something that has come about through the scientific investigation of these sites right right and i mean there's new sites that are opening up to the public all the time um i know that there's there's one in ohio that somehow got converted into a golf course but they're pushing yes that's yeah, yes that's the that's the Mound Builders Country Club, and that's yeah. I mean that's been that way for a very very long time, and that's that's a real sore point, you know. It's, well, they're they're working on getting that turned into a World Heritage Site, and I think they're actually succeeding at it. But uh -huh. I mean, if if by some chance, I think it's not necessarily open to the public all the time, but I think it is open occasionally, and that that's a huge site. That's, and a, that's a gorgeous yeah. site, and it's actually. I, I hate to say it, but they have maintained the wall itself. Oh, yeah. The walls yeah. themselves. I mean, they've added a few features because you need sand traps and water, apparently, to play golf. But I guess, right? Yeah, Listen, I, I don't know. I don't I've, play golf. I've been there. I've been there a couple of times, and it is it is really impressive. I mean, what it is is the, the, the country club, I believe it's the country club, has built a little bit of a boardwalk so that all year you can walk out to like kind of, kind of the edge of the – the double one's an octagonal enclosure, one's a circular yeah. enclosure, and then yeah. they're connected. And so you can see the site, but you're also seeing it with a bunch of you know sand traps and golf, tees yeah. and pe people playing golf. And then there, there I guess there are a few days a year when the golf, the, the the golfing is called off, and people can actually walk in and among the mounds. Now, I I agree with you, and I whenever I, I show the slides to my class, I mean, they're all horrified by the fact that this is a sacred site. This is a oh, sacred yes. site with human burials, and yes. we have a golf course around it. That the, yeah, the, I'm the, not the, okay with the golf course, but yeah. I will say that they haven't appeared to have done much in the way of damage to it. So right. the deal is, you know, that the historic preservation, we, we have this, the phrase called adaptive reuse, where right. rather than knocks an old building down, we change it somewhat, but we make it usable again. And that's a really good compromise. So it's true. <laughs> If the, if the golf course didn't exist, it is at least potentially the case that all those mounds would have been bulldozed and the, just like the surrounding area is all residential, there'd yes. be nothing but houses there and the, yeah. a faint memory of this one at one time being an Indian burial ground. Um, so there is that. However, and, you know, the you, you look at that and you go, well, how would we feel if somebody cordoned off an area at Arlington National Cemetery and, you know, right. put in a mini golf course in among the stones i think yeah. we would all be offended by that and i i think we, we have to respect the the I, i've spoken to native people in ohio who are pretty pissed off that that yeah still there um and the, the folks who run the golf course are they're all great people and they want you know some kind of a compromise out of this who knows what's going to happen in the future but i agree with you it's preserved at least one one reason why that thing still exists is because it wasn't developed for industry or for a shopping center or for for housing so we've we've hit our hour marker and i want to do a real quick wrap up um do you have any final thoughts on the whole mound builder myth, not myth thing. Well, I think the bottom line here for all of this stuff is that look, it's it's really important from an archaeological, historical, an anthropological, and a moral perspective to recognize that it's the native people, the people who have lived here for millennia, who's who who are the the, the authors of the magnificent and monumental earthworks that. Uh, are found throughout the American Midwest and Mid-South.
South, and that it's it's insulting to them and the memory of their ancestors to look for people other than them um, when the evidence clearly indicates it, in fact, was right. their ancestors. And then, and then my you know my my ending exhortation here is go and see these things for yourself. Um, you will not be disappointed. They are amazing. Go to Cahokia. Go to Serpent Mound. Go to to the the, the Hopewell Culture National. Uh, park. Go to Angel Mounds and and uh, Town Creek Mound and Etowah and Moundville. They're all over the United States. Go and see these things for yourself and prepare to be amazed. These sites reflect the, the great skills and abilities, architectural, engineering, mathematical, astronomical of, of the, the, this, this continent's first peoples. And that's the message that those mounds give us, the, the, the spectacular achievements of the native people of North America. It has nothing to do with mysterious races of folks who, who got here and uh, supplanted them or replaced them or anything like that. Right. No, and I, I completely agree with you. If, if people take nothing else away from this, they should take the go see your mounds. Go see your local mounds. There you go. Things. Take take your local mound to lunch. <laughs> hey, you go. and you can actually. Most of them have picnic facilities. Picnic tables. You can go Absolutely. and have a nice little lunch. Absolutely. Uh, well, Ken, thank you very much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I look forward to doing this again real soon. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. Ranger Trials has one we'll call. No, we don't do dinosaurs. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed it. Our music was provided by Archeo Suit Productions. If you've liked what you've heard, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Stitcher and share us wherever you use social media. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com. You can follow the podcast at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. To follow the blog, go to www.archiefantasies.com and get updates on Tumblr and Twitter at Archiefantasies. You can also look for us on Facebook. If you're looking for the show notes for this episode or episodes in the past, go to the podcast website at www.archaeologicalpodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. Thanks again for listening. evolution makes us smile Finding a wall and high-fiving Extrapolating from a single stone the extent of a whole complex and then publishing it as a completely known fact and making sure that everyone across the country knows about it because of a TV program makes us smile. But we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs.